Well, good afternoon and welcome to the next session here of the showcase. My name is Stein Waller. I work at the USGS Upper Midwest Environmental Science Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin, primarily conducting research on control and management tools for Dreisinid mussels. And um, Angelique Dahlberg, a PhD student here at the University of Minnesota is gonna present uh, our talk today on low dose copper for suppression of zebra mussels in Minnesota lakes. Thanks Diane for that introduction and thanks to everyone in the audience today. Um, we probably will still have a few people join um, since it's just 2.30 right now. But thanks for everyone, everyone for attending and for your interest in this work. So today I'm going to talk about our research on using a low dose of copper to suppress zebra mussel populations. Before I get into our work, I want to acknowledge Jim Luma. Jim was the project manager until last year and really spearheaded this project. Today, Diane is in that role. So when I conclude this presentation, she and I will both be answering questions. Um, before I get kicked off, I want to acknowledge some of our funding. Funding for this project came from the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, Hennepin County, the Pelican Lakes Association of Crow Wing County, the Fletcher Family Foundation, the Bay Lake Improvement Foundation, and some of the others shown on the slide. Additionally, Tonka Bay Marina provided invaluable support with technical operations. A number of other local and state partners provided technical, logistical, and outreach support as well. During this presentation, I'll begin with a brief overview of copper use in lake management and then describe the project objectives and study design. Although we will be discussing the effectiveness of a molluscicide, EarthTech QZ, this is not an endorsement for that product. If you haven't encountered zebra mussels, they are small striped two-shelled mollusks that can cause harm to some of Minnesota's water ecosystems. The mussels first appeared in Minnesota in 1989 and have spread to just over 180 of our lakes and rivers. They're a problem because they disrupt food chains and drastically alter habitats, making it harder for our native species to survive. Our research is investigating the use of copper to suppress zebra mussel populations. So a little bit about copper. Copper competes with ions at the gill membrane to disrupt osmoregulation in fishes and invertebrates, and it's toxic to aquatic organisms at certain concentrations. This means that copper may be an excellent tool for reducing zebra mussel populations, but it may also have negative impacts to desirable native species. Copper has a long history of use in aquatic systems. Copper plating was and still is used to a certain extent to prevent biofouling by organisms that attach, including zebra mussels. Copper sulfate has been used for over a century to control algae, nuisance vegetation, um, and snails. Early treatments involved pulling burlap sacks full of copper sulfate crystals behind boats. Today, our technology is hugely improved, but the general application process looks remarkably similar. In Minnesota, we've used um, different forms of copper to attempt to eradicate zebra mussels since about 2011. Some of the treatments have been done as part of a larger project involving multiple toxicants, such as potash and Zequinox. And most of these treatments have used a formulation of copper known as Earth Tech QZ, which is also the product that we are evaluating in our project. EarthTech QZ is an acid stabilized ionic copper formulation. Um, the treatments listed on the slide all targeted the adult stage of zebra mussels and used up to one milligram of copper per liter, which is the maximum allowed amount on the label. And all of these were in enclosed 
partial lake treatments in Minnesota. Treatment with EarthTech to a 12 hectare lake in Pennsylvania in 2017 was reported to successfully eradicate all mussels from the quarry that the treatment was done in. It was applied three times over 37 days at 0.44 milligrams of copper per liter, which was about half the labeled concentration. And long-term monitoring will confirm whether all zebra mussels were killed in that quarry. Um, so all of this work has been leading up to our project. So we know that copper concentrations of one milligram of copper per liter are toxic to adult zebra mussels. Recent research in the lab and the field further suggests that villagers, which are the larval life stage of zebra mussels, are more sensitive than adults are to copper products. In 2016, Mike McCartney, part of MASIC at the time, conducted trials with copper in enclosures to compare sensitivity of adults and villagers. He found that the concentration that would kill 50% of the villagers was 64 times lower than the concentration that would kill 50% of the adults. He also found that the concentration that would kill 99% of villagers was 18 times lower than the concentration that would kill 99% of adults. In another study, Renata Cloudy reported that the concentration that would kill 50% of villagers was 53 times lower than the concentration that would kill 50% of adults. So in summary, we know that copper concentrations of one milligram of copper per liter are toxic to adult zebra mussels. And we know that villagers are much more sensitive and die in much lower concentrations of copper. Currently, EarthTech QZ is registered for use in open water to manage zebra mussels. Past efforts in Minnesota lakes have shown that it will kill them. However, as I mentioned previously, while copper can be an excellent tool for reducing zebra mussel populations, it can also have really negative impacts to desirable native species. Before copper is used um, in zebra mussel management, more data are needed to determine how to minimize ecological and economic costs and to ma maximize long-term benefits to the water body. So the objectives of our project were to evaluate the effectiveness of very low dose concentrations of copper for villager suppression. Additionally, we wanted to measure the response of non-target organisms to the treatment. And finally, we also wanted to see whether the villager suppression would result in decreased zebra mussel density a year later, and if we could detect a benefit to native communities. So this information um, from our work thus far is new, it was previously unknown. We still have a lot of work to do to answer these questions, but we already know a lot more than we did. So for this project, as I mentioned earlier, we used EarthTech QZ. EarthTech QZ is certified for use in drinking water and does not have any impacts to human recreation or use. The product label allows for treatment up to one milligram of copper per liter, and the target concentration that we used was about 6% of that. Our initial dosing was to 100 micrograms of copper per liter with the assumption that the level would drop quite quickly initially. And then subsequent treatments were targeted to maintain a concentration of 60 micrograms of copper per liter. The application was scheduled around the period of peak villager abundance, which here in Minnesota is in July. So we applied the product to only the epilimnion, which is that top layer of water in a lake. Um, it's warmer than the lower levels with slightly different water chemistry, and there's limited mixing between that layer and the lower layer layers. Um, so because we were only treating that upper layer, we had to measure how deep that layer went before each application and then calculate the volume of water within that layer. And at our site during our study, um, the epilimnion typically extended down an average of five to six meters. 
So we treated the site every other day for 10 days, starting on July 22nd and concluding on July 30th of 2019. In addition to measuring zebra mussel responses, we assessed impacts to four fish species, a native mussel, zooplankton, um, benthic invertebrates, and then looked at some water quality and chemistry metrics. The study was conducted on Lake Minnetonka, which was well suited for this study. Zebra mussels were first found in Lake Minnetonka in 2010, and they're well established in areas of the lake. It was important to isolate the treatment and control bays, but it was also important to try and find areas with similar water quality, low zebra mussel population. Um, and the complexity of Lake Minnetonka allowed us to find two separate areas to use, one as a control site and one as a treatment site. So I've, I've shown a map of Lake Minnetonka on this slide and you can see both of the bays that we used for this. There were differences in size and bathymetry of the bays and some noticeable differences in substrate types. Um, so as, any, as in any field situation, conditions were not perfect, but, um, but the lake was still well suited for this. So Robinson Bay was our control bay. Robinson Bay had a surface area of 37 hectares, a maximum depth of 19 meters, and the bottom substrate ranged from sand to gravel. St. Albans Bay, down in the southeast of the lake, was our test bay. That bay was a little larger. It has a surface area of 66.3 hectares, but it's shallower with a maximum depth of 11.3 meters, and its bottom ranges from silt to organic rich substrate. So here's a schematic of um, St. Albans Bay. And there were five stations spread across each bay for sample collection of plankton, benthic grabs, water samples, and placement of settlement plates and caged animals. And we had five stations in each bay, which I guess I just said. So the copper treatment. Um, here you can gain a little bit of insight into what the treatment comprised. Up in the upper right of this slide is a small photo of our treatment barge. So you can picture yourself out on the lake. We pumped up lake water, mixed it with Earth Tech QZ, then applied it to about a quarter meter below the water surface via a four and a half meter horizontal boom that was fitted with hoses. And we applied at a set speed and according to a set route. The figure on this slide, the main graph, um, shows the measured copper concentration over the 10-day application period. Our initial dose was set to create a concentration of 100 micrograms of copper per liter. And I've shown that here with the little star symbol. Uh, subsequent bump treatments that occurred on alternate days were set to maintain a concentration at or above 60 micrograms of copper per liter. And those bump treatments are marked by the little crosses or plus signs on here. The 60 micrograms of copper per liter level is marked by the horizontal dotted line and um, so you can compare the actual concentrations to that goal concentration. You'll also notice that we have two concentration lines shown here. The dashed dark line shows the copper measurements that were calculated in the field using a Hawk meter, while the solid line shows the results from later ICP analysis done in the lab. And so that ICP analysis from the lab is more sensitive but it wasn't something that we could do in the field. So there were um, trade-offs to both measurements and we took both so that we could later compare them. And you can see that the mean ICP reading was about 50 micrograms of copper per liter, higher than the field measurements. One thing that is not shown on this figure is that copper concentrations decreased by about 50% within two weeks 
and we're back to a background level between 60 to 90 days after treatment. In total, we applied just over 7,200 liters of Earth Tech QZ over the 10 day treatment period. To understand how this treatment impacted zebra mussels, we monitored villager densities before and after treatment in both bays, juvenile presence on settlement plates in both bays, juvenile presence on settlement, or I'm sorry, um, adult presence in resident populations in both bays. And analysis of our data indicates that treatments effectively reduce zebra mussel villager density. So I've shown that on this slide. You can see these results visually on the graph. The columns of the graph depict the mean number of villagers found per liter of water. And the error bars here represent one standard deviation. Pre-treatment villager density in both bays was similar and even slightly higher in our test bay. After 14 days, the density was around the same level in the control bay as it had been before, but villagers were nearly absent in the test bay. So something happened over the course of that treatment. Additionally, the treatment effectively reduced zebra mussel settlement. We placed settlement plates in both bays retrieved half at 30 days after treatment conclusion and retrieved the other half at 90 days after treatment conclusion. At both time periods, we saw very few attached muscles in the test bay, while the numbers we saw in the control bay were more than three orders of magnitude greater. So this indicates strong treatment-related density reductions. And you can see in this figure, um, the columns represent the mean number of juvenile zebra mussels per square meter. The error bars, again, represent one standard deviation. And the, um, the lighter blue is the control bay, Robinson Bay, while the darker blue is the test bay, St. Albans Bay. And I've um, been using this, these two different colors so far, and I, I'll just say right now that I will continue using them, um, so I'll probably stop explaining the color difference, but you'll notice on this slide that the values for St. Albans Bay are so low that they don't actually visually appear on this graph, and instead we've written out the numbers um, along with the standard deviation as text. So again, we, we saw a clear difference between the bays. We also observed a decrease in adult resident zebra mussels in the treated bay. To assess this, we had a scuba diver run transects in both bays in early July before treatment, and then again in September, nearly two months following treatment. The scuba diver counted the number of living resident adults in quadrats along transect lines. You can see the results in the left-hand figure on here, as well as the number of dead individuals along transect lines. And you can see those results in the right-hand figure where instead of the total number of live zebra mussels, we're showing the percent of alive zebra mussels. So on the figure on the left, we show the mean number of adult zebra mussels found per square meter. Again, error bars represent one standard deviation. So you notice we did have quite a bit of variability. Um, and on the figure on the right, we show the percent of living adult zebra mussels found. Um, I'll, I'll just point out that these are different um, visual representations of data. The one on the right is a box and whisker plot, so you interpret it a little differently. Here, the wider box portion illustrates the range of values from which you find 25 to 75% of your values. And then the, the thinner lined whiskers that go up and down from that box illustrate the full range from minimum to maximum values with some identified outliers represented by dots. So prior to treatment, we saw similar densities in living adult zebra mussels. And after treatment, we continued to see high numbers of living adult mussels in the control bay. But the density and percent alive both declined by two orders of magnitude in the treated bay. And the later slide will show that the survival of 
these adult zebra mussels, how near the sampling buoys was also reduced in the treated bay. So these are the, the resident uncaged zebra mussels that we're showing here. In addition to those impacts to zebra mussels, we also looked at a variety of non-target impacts. First among those, we monitored some water quality and chemistry metrics. We observed a slight depression in dissolved oxygen and the treated bay after exposure. However, it didn't ever drop to a level that would cause harm to aquatic life. On this slide, I show the results for pH and dissolved oxygen readings. Along the vertical axis, you see the, you can read the value or concentration of those metrics. And along the horizontal axis, you can identify which date you took the reading at. Um, and then on the right, I've listed some of the metrics we took but that are not visually shown here. So I only picked two to show on the slide. Overall, our water quality parameters remained similar throughout the study period. All water quality constituents required for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's biotic ligand model were collected as planned and can be used to determine comparable copper concentrations in waters with different chemistry profiles. And I mention that because I will talk more about that model later in this presentation. So just know we collected a bunch of water quality and chemistry data. We found some impact to algal productivity as measured by chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A samples and secchi disk depth measurements were collected and measured one day prior to initial treatment, one day after the first day of treatment, and 14 days after treatment concluded. In the treated bay, both chlorophyll A concentrations and secchi disk depth indicated a substantial treatment-related increase in phytoplankton immediately after treatment, followed by decreases seen 14 days after treatment. Meanwhile, the control bay exhibited an increasing trend in chlorophyll A concentrations and a decreasing trend in secchi disk depth measurements over the sampling times indicating a steadily increasing phytoplankton community. And um, I've kind of shown those with the two arrows over on the right hand side. These trends in chlorophyll concentration um, are also shown in the graph. There. We found a decrease in the abundance of both benthic invertebrates and zooplankton. We counted benthic invertebrates in ponar grab samples, um, again, one day prior to initial treatment, one day after initial treatment, and then 14 days after treatment conclusion. In the control bay, abundance increased at each sampling point. In the treated bay, the opposite occurred, and there was no detectable difference in abundance between the sampling periods. And the figure for the benthic invertebrates is shown here on the left. Columns represent the mean number of invertebrates per liter and error bars represent one standard deviation. We also counted zooplankton using plankton toes. We conducted those again along that same um, time frame, one day prior to initial treatment, one day after initial treatment, 14 days after treatment conclusion. In the control bay, zooplankton density was greater 14 days after treatment compared to the pre and one day after treatment numbers. Um, and there was considerable reduction in the density of native zooplankton in the treated bay, both immediately after treatment and at the start of recovery 14 days after treatment. Zooplankton density is shown in the right-hand figure. Again, columns represent the mean number, this time of zooplankton per liter, and the error bars represent one standard deviation. We're also doing some community composition analysis on these numbers, and that uh, those results are still pending. In addition to those organisms we monitored that were already living in the lake, we also monitored caged fish, native mussels, and adult zebra mussels. So we placed fat mucket mussels, fathead minnows, bluegills, largemouth bass, yellow perch, and adult zebra mussels 
in independent cages beneath each buoy in each bay. The cages went in the day before treatment and were retrieved the day after treatment concluded. Survival was calculated based on the number of stocked organisms, not the number recovered, and sample sizes were either four or five, um, with each sample being located at a buoy. And um, we did have some loss, which is why some of them are four and not five. So the figure on this slide shows the percent survival of each species we observed, and the error bars represent one standard deviation. We saw that yellow perch and largemouth bass had similarly poor survival in both bays, maybe due to handling and holding stress. Um, and I do want to note that there was some handling stress during stocking. There were additional stressors at the buoy locations um, from shallow depth to predator presence, turbulence from boats. Um, there were kind of a variety of factors at play there. So it certainly was not um, like perfect conditions for the fish. Additionally, we had some challenges arise with recovery of our fish. For example, mortalities may have happened early, tissues were degraded and consumed by other individuals within the enclosures. Um, often what we saw was that we put in a certain number of fish and we got back a different number of fish and we're not 100% sure of what happened during that time period. And so this limited our ability to accurately determine mortality without making some assumptions. Um, and that's why survival, we're just noting that survival was calculated based on the number of stocked organisms. A main takeaway though, is that treatment related mortality was most apparent for zebra mussels and fathead minnows. One other thing to consider is that the survival of adult zebra mussels was still greater than 60% in the treated bay. Um, but this was only one day following treatment. And when we look at the scuba survey of the live resident zebra mussels in the bay and the high mortality rates there, um, we think that there was likely some delayed mortality. And there may also have been delayed mortality of native mussels. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> so once those fish and mussels were taken out of the lake, we sent them to the lab and analyzed their tissues for copper accumulation. So as you look at these data presented here, bear in mind that the sample size, again, is less than or equal to five. But in the treated bay, we saw that zebra mussels accumulated the most copper um, of, of all of the species in their soft tissues with an average of around 40.9 micrograms per gram, followed by native mussels. That had minnows in the treated bay had tissue copper concentrations an order of magnitude higher than those in the control bay, uh, and also appreciably higher than the other fish species. The copper tissue concentration correlates to toxicity for zebra mussels and fathead minnows, and native mussels have lower, filtra have lower filtration rates and so likely accumulate less copper. So in summary from um, this work in 2019, we see that treatments effectively reduce zebra mussel bellager density, juvenile mussel recruitment, and live zebra mussel density in quadrat samples. Non-target impacts varied. Uh, we saw relative zooplankton mean density reduced immediately after treatment, although it showed some recovery two weeks later. Chlorophyll A concentrations increased after treatment and survival and copper residue in fathead minnows suggest potential sensitivity in that species. So next steps. Moving forward from this, we want to learn what the long-term responses of zebra mussels and non-target organisms are to copper and if we can effectively apply less copper. So we're continuing monitoring in Lake Minnetonka this year and next year, 
And we would like to add a second lake to our study to increase our understanding of this. So for that second lake, um, we know that copper toxicity changes with water quality and chemistry, and we know that we can predict copper toxicity using different models, including the biotic ligand model, which is a model used by the US EPA to determine copper toxicity levels. So if we collect water quality and chemistry measurements from a lake, we want to know can we accurately predict the amount of copper to use to suppress spellagers? This in turn should result in minimal non-target impact. Um, we have a zebra mussel population and we have other organisms. The zebra mussels cause some negative impacts to the native organisms. And we want to figure out how to balance that with the impacts potentially of copper. And so we're hoping to figure out what the least amount of copper we can use would be. So a little bit more about the biotic ligand model. And I alluded to this way back at the beginning of the talk. This model is a tool that can predict the bioavailability and toxicity of copper to aquatic organisms under site-specific conditions. It's used by the US EPA as an acceptable criteria derivation method um, we know that water chemistry in lakes and rivers is variable, and we know that copper toxicity changes with water chemistry. Many factors, such as um, copper concentration, water chemistry and temperature, exposure time, can all mediate copper's effects in species-specific ways. In general, copper pesticides are more effective at higher water temperatures with longer exposure durations, um, and because copper competes with other cations to bind to the gills of aquatic organisms, copper is less toxic in harder waters and waters with higher pH and greater alkalinity where there is more calcium to compete with. The biotic ligand model uses pH, dissolved organic carbon, calcium, magnesium, sodium, um, sulfate, potassium, chlorine, alkalinity, and temperature, which I've all listed on here, to predict toxicity to freshwater organisms. So essentially how this model operates, you input the water chemistry values and the model provides a final acute value, a criterion maximum concentration and a criterion continuous concentration. The final acute value is an estimate of the highest concentration of copper that can be present while still protecting 95% of species present. If we determine the water quality and chemistry metrics that I just listed, that long list, we can use this model to predict that concentration. Additionally, we can estimate the criterion maximum concentration or the highest concentration of copper that a community can be exposed to briefly without an unacceptable effect. And we can also estimate the criterion continuous concentration, which is the highest concentration of copper that a community can be exposed to indefinitely without an unacceptable effect. And the, the term unacceptable effect is somewhat amorphous, but the EPA suggests that any statistically significant decrease in the number of taxa or a number of individuals in an assemblage should be considered unacceptable. So for this work, what we want to know is, can we use the water chemistry of a given lake to predict the concentration of copper we want to use to control an organism, zebra mussels, to a certain level? If we know something about the mortality impacts to an organism, zebra mussels, under certain conditions, we should be able to extrapolate and predict similar mortality impacts to that organism, zebra mussels, under different water chemistry conditions. So I'm not going to go into this too much further, but um, we have some options for predicting the lowest possible concentrations for copper. So this year, we are conducting one-year post-treatment monitoring on Lake Minnetonka. 
that includes settlement plates, scuba transects, valager toes, benthic invertebrate grabs, zooplankton toes, and chlorophyll A collection. We plan to continue post-treatment monitoring next year on Lake Minnetonka as well. And as I mentioned, we are planning ahead for working on a second lake. So our plan is to take water quality and chemistry measurements next summer, predict concentrations that would be toxic to villagers, and then test those predictions in a lakeside trailer lab setting. And we'll do some preliminary monitoring of the lake to establish baseline conditions. That information and those tests would then inform a treatment in 2022 that would be similar to the Minnetonka treatment. Um, there'd be a control and a test site, and uh, we, we would use the 2021 findings to um, inform all of that work. So ultimately, our research goals looking forward are to determine the long-term responses of zebra mussels and non-target organisms to copper, and to test the biotic ligand model and other bioavailability models to determine if we can predict a site-specific, specific lowest dose possible to suppress villagers while minimizing non-target impacts. And just a little sneak peek of some of our 2020 data um, fresh out of the field. This spring, we placed settlement plates out in both bays. We placed six separate settlement plates at each buoy. There were five buoys in each bay. On August 31st, we collected half of the settlement plates, or three from each buoy. The second half, the other three from each buoy, will be retrieved in early October. And each plate, we counted the number of zebra mussels per square meter which is the same process that we did last year. We don't have our October numbers yet, but looking at our end of August time period, we see that zebra mussel densities are much higher in our control bay for both years. And zebra mussel densities are higher in 2020 than in 2019 in both bays, respectively. You can see this figure on the slide here. The columns represent the mean number of zebra mussels per square meter on the settlement plates. We have incomplete data at this time. The October numbers will shed more light on this as well as additional settlement plates um, that we place in both bays next year. And it also is important to remember that um, these are bays of a larger lake and so there is a lot of movement um, across the lake or between the bays and the rest of the lake. In addition to the settlement plates, we conducted scuba transect surveys just as we did in 2019. And our results are shown here. As before, these are box and whisker plots. So again, we're looking at 25 to 75% of the data in the, the box portion. The percent of adult zebra mussels in Robinson Bay, which was our control bay, is relatively constant across the observation periods. But in our test bay, we see um, a similar percentage pre-treatment to the Robinson Bay levels, and then very few living mussels post-treatment. And in 2020, there were actually no live adults found in quadrats along transects. So um, it will be interesting to see how things continue with this work. And I guess at this point, we welcome questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. Um, I just want to invite our our participants to enter questions in the chat or the Q&A. And we do have a question already um, from Christopher. Do you sample submersed aquatic vegetation as part of this project or was it not present in both bays? Inverts, zooplankton, and algae could all be related to changes in vegetation composition and abundance. Thanks. 
there was vegetation present in both bays and we did not um, do any monitoring associated with this project. Okay, we have a uh, from Tam, Tom Langer. Your research shows promise to the copper technique in reducing the presence of zebra mussels. However, there's always costs and additional factors to consider in pursuing a treatment, i.e. mortality to native species. To that I ask, what is the density of zebra mussels in which ecosystem level degradation begins? Or phrased differently, to what density should managers target when controlling, not eradicating zebra mussels, to judge effectiveness, and to know when they have done enough and can move on to other AIS concerns? Yeah, that's a great question. And Diane, I know you and I have discussed <laughs> that. And we have this discussion a lot, yes. <laughs> it's so hard because it's, it's really, I mean, that's a management question and we are doing the research portion and not the management portion. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's really dependent on the water body and the goals of the community and the goals of the managers. I don't know, do you have anything to add to that? I, I would, um, I guess, just back that up, that I think every, every water body is different. We, we talked about this with our uh, lunch group today, that every, every water body presents its own management challenge and that, that density, um, how much a lake can tolerate will vary from one water body to another. So I think that does have to be one of the first steps in determining actions, a management action, is what are the goals? Is it to protect native mussels? Is it to try to maintain um, the walleye population and, and growth of those young of the year walleye? Is it, um, you know, to reduce some of the macrophyte beds because of the increased water clarity, or it could be managing for recreation in, um, you know, the, the lakeshore environment. So it's a great question, and I think we, one we should be having every time we look at a management action. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm falling behind here on the questions. Um, from James, to see if our lake would be a candidate for future copper treatment or zebra mussels, who would we contact? Well, I, we are currently um, in the process of planning for 2021 and 2022. We, we do not have a specific lake at this time. Uh, we are looking for um, certain like conditions in a lake. So just to, I guess, ideal conditions. Um, a lake needs to have an established zebra mussel population. We're looking for it to be of a certain size so that as with Minnetonka, the control and test phase can be relatively independent of one another. Obviously, they're connected to the rest of the lake, but um, you know we don't want the, the treatment in the treated bay affecting the control bay, so we need them to be a certain distance apart. It's great, would be great, will be great to have lots of knowledge of the lake ecology, ideally before and after zebra mussel introduction, so then we could compare so we'd have like pre-invasion data, post-invasion data, and then post-treatment data to compare to those two other time periods. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're, we're still planning that, that portion out. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of considerations for uh, 
the candidate link. So I think you summarized those well there. Um, the next question from Jeff is, did you test the densities of zebra and native mussels in other areas of the lake? Um, we did not. There has been other, I mean, there's a, a ton of monitoring happening on Lake Minnetonka. So some of that information does exist out there, but we, we did not do that. Yeah, other than just the um, identification of a suitable treatment bay. We've actually done quite a bit of work in Robinson's Bay before this. So it was more the year before in 2018, finding uh, a suitable and isolated bay. And I know that not the native mussels, but uh, zebra mussels were monitored in the, in the bay that year. Uh, the next question from Frederick, what is the most challenging aspect of this study? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Gosh, we should both answer that. Um, go ahead and go first. Yeah, what is the most? Um, probably, I don't know if it's the most challenging necessarily, but thinking about, I mean, we're trying to balance control of zebra mussels with non-target impacts. And ultimately this is supposed to protect our native organisms, right? Zebra mussels can have a, a negative influence on a negative impact on our native species. And so we, in this case and in other cases, deemed them to be um, something we need to manage and control. And so really keeping in mind and doing that balancing of always, always doing more good than harm. And um, you know, it's really hard, um, I guess just trying to to find that out. Um, and we based our initial, our 60 micrograms of copper per liter on some of the previous work that had been done in Robinson's Bay. And our results came back and suggest we can use a lower concentration because we did see adult mort mortality and you know, villagers are more sensitive than adults. So if we saw adult mortality, we can likely use a lower concentration um, so just, it's a, it's a really good goal, um, but also difficult. I don't know. I don't know if I articulated that well, but keeping that in mind and trying to improve the system. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, the question about uh, monitoring vegetation Ideally, we'd want to monitor every component um, of the ecosystem, but how you do that on limited resources is very challenging. So I think trying to get the most information that we can on those non-target impacts with limited um, resources is, is always a challenge. And I think looking, moving forward, it would be nice to be able to partner uh, with others that are already doing some monitoring of other uh, components in, uh, in the next candidate lake. Yeah. Uh, the next question from Reynolds, any studies being done on copper control and dissolved solids already in the lake and would dosing levels change? I don't, I don't think any of that work is happening. Um, I did a little bit of like post analysis, looking at how copper toxicity changed over the course of the 10 day treatment. 
Um, but I didn't, we, we didn't do any of that dissolved solid work. And I, I don't know that anyone else has done that. No, I'm not, we have not done it. And I would expect that it would change uh, dosing levels. The, the effective target dose that it would change with higher suspended or dissolved solids. Um, another question, let me see if I can, I lost it here. Have you, this is from Frederick, have you done or considered other chemical treatments other than copper? Yeah, I think Diana, I'll let you, I, copper is the only thing that I have worked with, but I know you have done quite a bit of work with, with other pesticides. Yes, yeah, so we have actually conducted uh, quite a bit of work on a biopesticide called Zequinox. So this is a killed bacterium that is actually pretty selective uh, for dry synod mussels. Um, there's challenges with it and that it's quite expensive and uh, more difficult to apply. But yeah, there's quite a bit of information out there in Zequinox and it has been used even in Minnesota uh, in a couple of the rapid response actions and last year or may, might be two years ago now that it was used on a demonstration project in uh, Lake Michigan as well. And I'm currently doing a, quite a bit of work with carbon dioxide um, as our, our invasive carp group um, at USGS. We're also looking at carbon dioxide as an effective control for Dreisinid mussels and like low dose copper, we can use a pretty low amount of carbon dioxide to prevent villager settlement. So the other thing is that each of these has use in different situations. So the, the choice of the tool that you're gonna use really depends on uh, what that management goal is and what the situation is in the, the water body. Um, I missed a couple questions here. What is the approximate cost per acre for this treatment? Oh, good question. We have... I, I'm, we I'm have pulling that. it up here. Yeah, we've been asked this before. <laughs> we, ha we have an answer. Uh, if I can find it. $14.23 per acre foot of water. Um, but this was based on our application costs. So there's a lot of, uh, it could potentially be less than that, um, depending on the applicator and, and so forth. But that's what it was on this treatment was about $14 per acre foot of water. Um, so another question from Frederick, were you monitoring for total copper or dissolved copper? Total copper. Okay. I think, I think we've covered all the questions so far. We still have a couple more minutes if anybody has any additional. Yeah, that's great. And if, um, if folks do have questions later, our contact information is up here. Feel free to email. There's also more information available um, at the two websites that are shown here. So we are happy to talk more. And, and thanks everyone for joining and for the great questions. We'll hang on a couple more minutes here if anybody has additional questions. But again, thank you. And as Angelique said, feel free to um, contact us through email if you have any additional questions.
comments, and so forth. Oh, here's one more, one more question from Jessica. How do you think treating a bay would differ from treating a lake? Yeah, so I'm trying to remember. I, I know you can probably say it off the top of your head, Diane, but um, EarthPEC is labeled what for for half half of the lake. Yeah, you can't uh, by label instructions. You can't treat more than half the water body at one time. So, so that might affect it. Um, and definitely the, the size of the water body will uh, make a difference in the logistics of treating. Yeah. Yeah, and probably if there's, um, if it's if there's a lot of variability in water chemistry across the the lake, that would be something you would need to take into account because toxicity would change spatially. And even the depth of the thermocline could mm -hmm. vary considerably from one area to another. There, you know, I'm kind of opening another can of worms here, but the other thing that um, has come up that also is another question is whether or not the copper has to be maintained for 10 days or whether another strategy might be to apply copper several times throughout the season for a shorter period of time. So in that way you may be identifying hot spots in a lake where villagers are um, in higher density at, at certain times. Uh, that might not necessarily reduce the total amount of copper that's used, however, if you're applying it uh, a number of times instead of, you know, within a 10-day window. But again, just another potential strategy for most effective copper use. Yeah, and one thing um, that we were so this work is not, these concentrations are not meant to um, like fully eradicate a population. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at reducing the population and controlling it, ideally to a level where it's below zebra muscle impact, which, you know, we talked about that a little bit with one of those first questions and what, what is that level and how that kind of varies. So there still is definitely a lot of room for more research in this area, but um, that kind of ties into the, that idea, I guess, of hot spots for villagers and figuring out maybe the most strategic way to suppress the population. That was a little bit of a tangent, but. Okay, well, I think we're coming to the end of our time here. If there are no more questions. Oh, wait, there might be. <laughs> oh, one last question. Uh, I lost it now. From Frederick, are you open to studying other copper delivery modalities? Um, Probably not as a part of this study, but I think, yeah, there's always that possibility. Yeah, and like I just, I guess like I just said, I mean, there's so much room for additional research. So it's definitely a possibility, um, not for this, but, you know, for another Study. Yeah, actually, that was one of our focuses when we were looking at working with Zequinox was different application methods to try to maximize 
exposure of zebra mussels to the Zequinox um, and not other organized organisms. So yeah, that's uh, definitely another area of research. Okay, well, thank you, Angelique. Great job. And thanks again to everybody for listening in and all the, the great questions. Enjoy the rest of the showcase. Thanks, everyone.